Hi everyone, and welcome to GISC 125, Mapping and Spatial Thinking. And today we're going to discuss what spatial thinking is, and some examples of spatial thinking and how it can be used to solve geospatial problems. So what do you think spatial thinking is? Give a second here to think about, about that. So spatial thinking involves knowing about space, using different representations of space, and making reasoned decisions concerning space. So spatial thinking is a spatial term in essential to know and apply to geography. So it enables people to take an active questioning approach to the world around them and to ask what, where, when, and why types of questions about people, places, and environments. Spatial uh, thinking kind of enables people to formulate uh, answers to critical questions about past, present, and future spatial problems, and spatial organizations use it. So to anticipate the results of events in different locations and to predict what might happen given specific conditions. So my interest and the focus of this class mostly lies on the geographic side. So perhaps a better definition would be geospatial thinking, because we could have just spatial thinking in terms of if you think about kids and building blocks, or if you have geometric shapes as kids, you know, and how to put those geometric shapes, you know, a circle into a circle, hole, and so forth. Or spatial thinking could even be um, building something. You know, you get some furniture from Ikea and how it goes together. So that's spatial thinking as well. But for us, we want to involve kind of geospatial thinking kind of which overlaps with some geo-literacy, which we'll talk about, which has been uh, kind of receiving increasing attention. So my working definition of geospatial thinking is identifying, analyzing, and understanding the location, scale, patterns, and trends of the geographic and temporal, and temporal means time, relationships among data, phenomena, and issues. So throughout the semester, we'll be returning to this definition through examples to better understand these things. So let's take a look at this and how we can maybe apply it. So this is the 2012 presidential election results map. And this is a choropleth map of the contiguous United States by county. And the presidential election results are uh, represented by percent of county voters that voted for either Obama and the percent voted for Romney. So counties with a greater than 50% results for Obama are blue, and oppositely, those greater than 50% for Romney are in red. So the deeper the blue and the red colors indicates a higher percentage. For example, voters in Washington, D.C., areas kind of favored Obama, and voters in Idaho generally favored Romney. So and when you look at this, are there any spatial patterns in this data? And do it, can they reveal? There's clearly spatial patterns here. For example, what can we say about the major urban areas? Like Seattle, Tacoma are blue, San Francisco, blue, Los Angeles metro is blue, same with Chicago, Detroit, Boston metro areas, New York metros, Philadelphia, Washington, Miami, San Antonio, Austin, Houston metro areas in Texas. These are all blue. We can see these in the map, kind of these urban areas, college towns, so forth, are very blue. These are high density urban areas, and on the east coast as well, kind of blue, on the coast as well, is blue. For the moment, let's define uh, minorities as Hispanics, Blacks, and Native American populations. Can you tell from this map where the majority is voted? So let's include, so Imperial Valley, can look at uh, Nevada, places in Nevada, blue, Miami Metro, along the border, the Mississippi Southern Belt, Native American reservations, you can see these blue, in the other places, these all uh, voted Democrat. So the Midwest, or as often referred to by the media, the kind of the flyover country, and rural areas generally vote red and Republican. We can kind of see that as well. 
So without, so with such, so much red on this map, how did Obama win the election? Because it looks like these kind of areas would, uh, there's lots of, lots of red, much more red than blue. So let's take a look at that. So this map shows the U.S. population density by county. And notice that the areas that are largely red have a very low population density, while areas that are highly blue, or largely blue, have a high population density. Since electoral college votes are based on the population of the state, so places like Los Angeles in California has about 10 million people, and New York has a lot of people, Florida has a lot of people, they have a lot of electoral votes. Places like Idaho, not so many. So, do you think there's any correlation between race and ethnicity and voting patterns? So here we can kind of look at the deeper the blue, the greater percentage of white, and we can look at Hispanics, the darker the this orange rust color is, the greater the Hispanics. Blue, or excuse me, not blue, but uh, greens, darker the green, the greater the percent um, African American. Then you can look at yellows, and we can see where Native Americans are. So, any kind of voting patterns there? We can look at those, and yeah, certainly, along the Texas-Mexico uh, border, lots of Hispanics, largely blue, Native American reservations, lots of blue, the South, Mississippi Delta, lots of blue, but then also, up in New England, lots of white people, but they also seem to vote Democrat, the same as along with the, the East Coast, and same along with in Seattle area. So here's a map, and this is the population percent below poverty level. So the darker the color, the greater percentage of people who are in poverty. Once again, we can kind of look at that. Certainly seems to be some, but you can also look places in New York where the uh, poverty level is not high, but they still vote for uh, Obama in this case. So there might be some kind of correlation here. Median household income. So the darker the red, the higher the median household income, the lighter color, lower median household income. So again, we can look at the coasts, east coast, west coast, high median household income, but they also vote Democrat, but also lower income areas in the, in along the Texas-Mexico border, Native American uh, reservations, lower income, African Americans, they seem to vote Democrat as well. So there seems to be some kind of correlation, some kind of crossover. Here is the 2016 presidential election map. And this map is generally the same patterns that we saw in the 2012 map. But there's only one difference, and that's Utah. In Utah, especially around Salt Lake area, kind of in there, we see yellow. What's this yellow? Who is who is the yellow? That was Gary Johnson votes. So... Um, he was out of Utah, and so he seemed like he got some votes in Utah, but not very far away from Utah. So, by spatial thinking, you have identified data patterns, right? Where there's high Democrats voting, high Republican voting. You have identified several links between voting patterns and socioeconomic and demographic characteristics. All visually in a few seconds. So maps are a powerful way of communicating information. So the most important questions that a spatial thinker asks is not where, but why. So where by itself is important, but to stop there cuts short spatial thinking and subsequently spatial analysis that could result uh, in more information and better information. So at its best, where by itself is a scaffold upon which we can hang other geographic knowledge and build our skills. At its worst, where by itself is just a place name. Imports and exports, the capes and bays, memorizing stereotypes that make geography and educators kind of twitchy. To nurture spatial thinking, we must couple the where with the why. So the aim of this course is to help guide you to become more spatially literate. And spatial literacy is the component, uh, is the competent and confident use of maps, mapping, and the spatial thinking to address ideas, situations, and problems with daily life, society, and the world around us.
So we want to become more spatially literate. So here's some examples we can look at too in terms of spatial pattern and spatial thinking. So if you ever ask yourself, why do some things exist at a specific location? Why do certain people live in certain neighborhoods? Do cities or natural landscapes have order? Or are they merely a random kind of assortment of objects in space? So these questions are central to understanding geographic patterns. So let's look at the satellite image that shows the arid state of New Mexico. While this is one of the driest states in the United States, you can see, still see that there's a significant area of uh, trees. However, the trees exist in the natural landscapes of New Mexico are all clumped together in very specific regions of the state. So the reason for this spatial pattern of clustering is because of why. What do you think some reasons might be? What about soil moisture, elevation, and temperature at these locations are amenable to survival of trees, while the remaining uninhabitable areas of the state have inhospitable conditions for trees. So in this sense, locations closer together have similar physical and climate characteristics, thus creating trees to exist close together in the landscape, essentially composing distinct forests. So we will get more into this kind of this idea of nearer things or more related to distant things coming up. So here is the suicide belt, and it's a region of the United, in the western United States where the suicide rates are particularly high compared to the national average. So there's many thoughts as to why suicide rates are so high in these areas. For example, middle age and an aging white man, single, unattached, often unemployed. These are high rates of suicide. American Indians have high rates of suicide. Residential stability plays a great role in explaining the West's higher suicide rates than other factors such as race, religiosity, socioeconomic class, and even gun ownership. The very traits associated with the West, this kind of romanticized of American culture, individualism and independence, stoicism and solitude may have deep, neg deep negative implications for its people. Areas with high rates of population change like the West have more newcomers, and temporary residents, and consequently attenuated social ties and weak social institutions such as marriage and religion. So in turn, lower social integration levels and increased suicide rates um, are some good possibilities of why suicide rates are higher in these areas. So if, let's think spatially about this uh, map here. And we're looking at a river system and think about what's going on here with this river in Texas is in Texas. Uh, we can see a general pattern or trend where all the rivers are flowing in a certain direction. And without knowing anything else, we hope we can understand the geography of why these river systems are flowing into one specific direction. We can start to see that we have elevation change from the west to the east towards the Gulf of Mexico. So we can see that these river patterns are generally trending towards the west to the east into the Gulf and ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. So asking these kind of spatial questions of why are the rivers flowing in this direction and we can answer that and it's due to elevation. So quickly here effective spatial thinkers need and we'll start with skills are important and there's many of them such as adding and manipulating spatial data changing legends, working with pop-up information, working with tabular information, working with scale and other kind of spatial statistics, understanding map projections, querying and sorting data, doing overlay operations, and geodatabase designs are all very important skills to acquire for somebody who is a spatial thinker. So increasingly, the spatial, these skills require geospatial technologies such as GIS, GPS, and remote sensing, as well as mathematics, computer science, and also personal personnel that are kind of competent and well-organized that can use this data and manipulate this data. The next is content knowledge is critical to success as well. For example, to work with climate data in a uh, spatial contest effectively means that the, the person 
understands how climate systems work, including the intertropical conversion zones and local convections, the effects of mountain ranges, ocean currents, air pressure, water vapor, and much, much more. So the same is true for other concepts such as watersheds, ecosystems, energy production and consumption, the dynamics of population change, how natural hazards form and the impacts they have, human environment interaction, transportation, trade networks, and social fabrics. So all these things, if you want to be a spatial thinker, you must know the underlining information about that. And finally, the geographic perspective is critical. So the geographic perspective begins with asking relevant, thoughtful questions. The geographic perspective is seeking, uh, seeing the world as a system of interconnected systems, from local to global, um, each united by some location or set of locations in some kind of spatial fat pattern, or maybe there isn't a pattern. But the geographic perspective is tied to geographic inquiry. And the geographic inquiry process entails asking a geographic question, gathering relevant geographic data, analyzing that data, assessing the data, making a decision based on that data, and this process often leads to additional questions, which in turn leads to kind of additional gathering and analyzing and making further decision makings. And we'll get into this in an in a upcoming lecture. So it's basically a uh, problem-based approach and is similar to the scientific method.